As we get into tonight's uh, topic, I, I want to uh, remind you that you're encouraged to comment uh, during the time of prayer and the time or the time of study that we're going to do. And also tonight, uh, you're welcome to share. And I would encourage you to do both of those two things, to share and, of course, to comment. You'll notice behind me there's a Bible on the screen, and also behind the Bible is We the People. And uh, folks, you know, our nation was founded and freedom has been a vital part of our living. And tonight we're dealing with a subject that tonight you may have some opinion on, and that's certainly great you're entitled to that. But uh, the question that we're dealing with on our topic talk, and we're going to be doing this for the next several weeks. Oh, by the way, next week I will not be on, so we're going to take a week off, and then uh, I'll be back the following week. So don't think that we've disappeared. Uh, we're just going to take a, a week and uh, refresh ourselves, and we'll be back the following week on topic talk, prayer time, and all the other things that we're doing. But uh, what we're dealing with tonight is simply this. Are Christians to disobey governmental authority? Now, we've seen a lot of things occur in our nation over the last year. Uh, pandemic, then the unrest that we've seen taking place. We've seen looting. We've seen burning. We've seen riots. We've seen protests. We've seen so many things. And we've seen some violent actions that have taken place. We've seen marches. We've seen what happened in Washington, D.C. It's just been really um, somewhat even breathtaking, if you would, over the things that we have faced. And we've seen people break the law. We've seen people take lives. We've seen people rob stores and, and just a host of things. Well, I'm not so much focusing on that. I'm dealing with tonight the fundamental fact tonight of the question. Are Christians to disobey governmental authority? So to really, and this is a hot topic based on the issues, and your vote tonight determined this topic. We had a, a lot of votes for this, so this is what we're dealing with. To best understand this topic, though, I think we have to go back really into the historical time of the Word of God to gather information on the subject. I think... We all have opinions, don't we? And you know, a lot of times of our opinions are very important to us, but there's times that our opinion really is not maybe the right opinion, and I'm not being judgmental in that. Our opinions and our lives should line up with God's Word and what God says. And so let's take the Bible. And I think that's the best place tonight for us to examine what we're dealing with and let's step back into time for a few moments. We're going to take a time journey tonight. Uh, and as we go back through the pages of God's Word and through the historical facts that we have before us, I think it will help us to better understand. The, the Emperor of Rome from AD 54 until AD 68 was a man by the name of Nero. Now, this emperor was uh, not known for being very moral, nor was he known for being ethical. And, uh, and really, he was a very evil person. In AD 64, we find the great Roman fire occurred with Nero himself being suspected of arson and doing the very act himself or committing that act. So in his writing, the, the Roman senator and historian uh, records, and this is what he says, to get rid of the report that he had started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted most uh, exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. So that being the case, it was during the reign of Nero that the Apostle Paul wrote what we know as the epistle of the book of Romans, the letter. When we say epistle, of course, that is just a nice word for a letter. And he was writing letters, and I believe there are 16 letters or chapters that he wrote to uh, the Christians there at Rome. So while one might expect him to encourage the Christians in Rome to rise up against their uh, oppressive ruler, in chapter 13 we find something rather um, alarming of sorts, but informative 
and he gives us a better look. So let's see what Paul addressed here. Now, you may think, well, come on, Pastor. We're in 2021, and that was years and years and eons of years ago. Let me tell you something, friend. The Bible is applicable today as it was then. God's word is true. It's faithful. God can say to the uttermost, the plan of salvation is the plan that God has prescribed by Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. Not only that, but what God has said, we have tried to, by writing different uh, Bibles and things to try to define what God is saying and make it more acceptable, I guess maybe would be the word in the English language. Sometimes we've distorted that truth and uh, we have not been honest with people in those writings. So I tend to lean upon the word of God as authoritative. I tend to lean upon God's word as being all truth, which it is. And therefore, if I will follow the guidelines that are given in scripture, then I can live a life that is pleasing to God, that is acceptable to God, and that will glorify God, and that we can be rewarded of when we stand before him. So this is what Paul said. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the power that be are ordained of God. We have forgotten that in our society. We have totally, and this is one of the issues that troubles me with our society as Christians. The secular world, the heathenistic world, is going to act like what they are. And I'm not being judgmental in saying that. It's just a fact. But Christians are today to be living for God and by the direction of the word of God. And so therefore, there is a standard which we go by, not our opinion or not what we think or not what the Republicans nor the Democrats or whoever, or you name it, says. It's what God's word says. So I'm going back to that verse again because this is really a, a, a bed line here. This is a bedrock of our belief system. But let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So, for there is no power but of God, and the power that be are ordained of God. So, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. For thou, uh, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beateth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a uh, revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, that's taken from Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 7. Even unto the reign of this ruthless and godless emperor, by the name of Nero, Paul's writings then under the inspiration and understand that was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit tells his readers to be subjection, uh, to be subjected to the government. They are to submit themselves to the leadership of the government. Moreover, he states that no authority exists other than that that is established by God and that rules uh, or rulers rather are serving God in their political office. Now, we may many times think, well, they're not following the guidelines of God's word and they're not going by what our founding fathers uh, determined back in 1776. You're right. But let's not jump off the cliff yet. Peter writes nearly the same thing in one of his two letters that he wrote in the New Testament to the people. This is what Peter said. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to be the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. 
For so is the will of God that uh, with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. That's really important there in that last verse. And so he says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. That's in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17. Now, we look at this and both Paul and Peter's teachings have led to quite a few questions. If you think about that uh, from Christians where civil disobedience is concerned. So with what we have faced as a nation over the past several months, actually over the past year, uh, regardless of your political preference, reacting in violence is not God's plan, is it? You know, we have ways to correct if there's things being done in government that are not correct. And one of the greatest things that we can do, and many Christians don't do, and that is vote. The best way, if you want to remove someone who is not following the guidelines of God's word, then get to the polls and vote for the person that best is suited and qualified. I would never tell you to vote who to vote for. I would never tell you to vote for a particular party. I would tell you to research, examine, and then exercise the right that you have to go and vote. And so therefore, both Paul and Peter's teachings then uh, give us great information and direction in what we're doing. Paul and Peter means that Christians are, are to submit to whatever the government commands, no matter what is asked of them. Now, we have a lot of things that we don't agree with. And I'll tell you one that I'm vehemently opposed to, and that is abortion. It's wrong. It's murder in any way that you look at it. But listen, going out here and taking other people's lives and hurting people is not the solution. There are means and there are ways. But we've got to remember something as people. It's not us that's in control. It's not necessarily the government's in control. God is in control, and we're living in a fallen generation. And what do you expect when we're living today in a world that is inundated with sin. So what are we to do then, preacher? I mean, you mentioned voting, and that's well and good. You are to do exactly what Jesus said, and he gave us that great teaching that we ignore in Christianity and in the church, and that is what we find in the Sermon on the Mount. What did, he, what did he say in the latter part of what he recorded in the book of Matthew? Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father is in heaven. We are not to take things into our own hands. We are to pray and we are to do that which is honoring to God and to do that which is right. We never have today a green light from God or permission to go out and do malicious acts and take lives and do things in in a riotous way that's hurtful and harmful to other people's lives. It's wrong. So you look at this, and let me just give you some various views today of civil disobedience today that maybe we can get a better light on. There are at least three general positions on this matter of civil disobedience. So the uh, arch, arch, the, the those today, there's a group that says, uh, the Ark of Christ view says that a person can choose to obey uh, or disobey rather. They can choose to disobey the government whenever they like and whenever they feel like it and is personally justified in doing so. Uh, these are anarchists. They, they have no basis in what they're doing. And such a statement today and a stance today has no biblical support today whatsoever as evidence in the writings of Paul as we read in Romans 13. So the extremist patriotic view today says that a person should always follow and obey his country no matter what the command. Now you say, well, that sounds more in line, right? Well, does it? As we will uh, see and as will be shown in a moment, this view also does not have uh, biblical support. Moreover, it's not supported in the history of, of uh, nations. For an example, let me give you an example. During the uh, Nuremberg trials, the attorneys for the Nazis, Nazi war criminals, attempted to use the, the, the defense that their clients 
were only following the direct orders of the government and therefore could not be held responsible for their actions. They are held responsible for their actions because they made the choice to do those things. However, one of the judges dismissed their arguments with this simple question. But gentlemen, this is a quote, but gentlemen, is there not a law above our laws? Absolutely. So the position that the scriptures today is upheld is one of biblical submission with a Christian being today allowed to act in civil uh, disobedience to government if, a, if it commands evil such that it requires a Christian to act in a manner that is contrary to the clear teachings of what God's word requires of us in his word. So civil disobedience, let me, uh, let me draw in another way up here for you from scripture because that's really our authority to begin with today. In Exodus 1, the, Egyptians, the Egyptian Pharaoh gave the clear command to two Hebrew midwives that they should wear uh, that they were to kill all male Jewish babies. Well, an extreme patriotic would have carried out the government order. Yet the Bible says that the midwives disobeyed, uh, disobeyed Pharaoh and feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. That's Exodus chapter 1 verse 17. Then the Bible goes on to say something else today, that the midwives then lied to Pharaoh about why they were letting their children live. Yet, even though they lied and disobeyed their government, God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very mighty because the midwives feared God. He established a household for them. That's found in chapter 1 of Exodus verses 20 and 21. Then we step over into the book of Joshua and Rahab directly disobeyed a command from the king of Jericho to produce the Israelite spies who had been in, who had entered into the city to gain intelligence for battle. So instead she let them down. You remember the story. She let them down via a rope so that they could escape. And even though Rahab the harlot had received a clear order from top governmental officials she resisted that command and was redeemed from the city's destruction when Joshua and the Israelite, Israelite army destroyed it. Then we go further. I'm giving you the case from the word of God. The book in 1 Samuel records a command given by King Saul during a military campaign that no one could eat until Saul had won the battle with the Philistines. Well, Saul's son, Jonathan, who had not heard the order, ate honey to refresh himself from the hard battle army uh, that, of the army that he was engaged in and had waged. And so when Saul found this out and about it, he ordered his son, he ordered his son to die. However, the people resisted uh, Saul and his command. And so therefore, Jonathan was saved and uh, from being put to death for Samuel chapter 14, verse 45. Another example of civil disobedience is keeping with biblical submission that is found in 1 Kings chapter 18. This chapter briefly introduces a man named Obadiah who feared the Lord greatly, as the Word of God says. And when Queen Jezebel was killing God's prophets, you realize Obadiah took a hundred of them and hid them, and so hid them from Jezebel so that they could live and would survive. Such an act was in clear defiance of the ruling of civil authority of that day. Daniel records a number of civil disobedient examples. The first is found in chapter 3 of Daniel, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the golden idol in disobedience to King Nebuchadnezzar's command. So the second is in chapter 8, when Daniel defies King Darius and uh, his decree that he is not to pray and uh, unless he is basically praying through the king in you know the story so here we are in the book of daniel and in both cases god rescued his people from the death penalty that was imposed signifying his approval of their actions now in the new testament you say well that was all old testament you're right so let's go into new testament in the New Testament, the book of Acts records the civil disobedience of Peter and John towards the authorities 
that were in power in that particular time. So after Peter healed a man born lame, Peter and John were arrested for preaching about Jesus and they were placed in jail. So the religious authorities were determined to stop them from teaching about Jesus. However, Peter said this, he says, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about uh, what we have seen and heard, Acts chapter 4. So later, the rulers confronted the apostles again and reminded them of their command to not teach about Jesus. But Peter responded, we must obey God rather than men, Acts chapter 5. So one last example of civil disobedience is found in the book of Revelation, where the Antichrist commands all those who are alive during the end time that they worship the image of himself. But the apostle John writes and he records in Revelation and states that those who become uh, Christians at that particular time will disobey the Antichrist and his government and refuse to worship the image, Revelation chapter 13, just as Daniel and his companions had violated Nebuchadnezzar's decree to worship idols. So then we come to this issue of civil disobedience. Let's, let's draw the web in on a conclusion here. What conclusion can be drawn today from the above biblical examples that I've just shared with you over the last few moments and the guidelines for a Christian civil disobedience basically can be, let's just sift it down and sum it up like this. One, Christians should resist a government that commands or compels uh, evil and should work non-violently within the laws of the land to change a government that permits evil. There's a way that can it be handled, but unfortunately people in the generation in which we're living just choose to go out and take things in their own hands, which is not the way God designs uh, the plan for your life and mine, as, and in, even in government. Then secondly, civil disobedience is permitted when the government's laws are commanded and are in direct violation of God's law and command. So realizing that, thirdly, if a Christian disobeys, an, an evil government, unless he can flee from that government, he should accept that government's punishment for his actions. So we find Christians are certainly permitted today to work to install new governmental leaders. That's what we do in our voting within the laws that have been established. One of the greatest tools that you have apart from the voting is to hound your senators and your congressmen and let them know what you expect of them and that they are the paid servants and this is what is expected of them. Just not by what the world wants, but what Christians believe what God's word says. That's the principle that we were founded upon. That Bible you see behind me on that screen is the principle in which our nation was founded. So let me just sum this up because I'm, I'm out of time. Christians are commanded to pray for their leaders today and for God to intervene in the times to change any ungodly path that they are pursuing. The greatest tool that we have is what we're going to be doing at 7 o'clock, and that is prayer. Listen, Christians are to pray. Paul said to pray consistently and to pray unceasingly. And we are to have that attitude of prayer and to believe that God can change hearts and minds. So we go to the Word of God, and Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 2, and he says, I exhort therefore that, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. So I come to this point of conclusion. We must be careful today to... Uh, identify ourselves with the Word of God. Our personal convenience is never a legitimate reason today for disobeying government or taking things into our own hands, nor are our traditions worthy, uh, worthy grounds for such disobedience. Do not be quick to disobey the biblical obligation to obey our governmental authorities. We we are to pray for them, and we've got tools where we can right the wrong. And such disobedience without having a clear biblical basis in itself 
of rebellion against one of God's institutions, and that's government. So don't take today Paul's warning lightly. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive uh, to themselves damnation. Romans 13, 2. I know that this is a touchy subject. I know we're living in a touchy generation. I know that we don't like a lot of the things that we are seeing taking place. But I'm going to tell you, your best combat against things is prayer, calling upon God. Let me tell you, God will always see that things are done right, and only God can turn things around. So when we go out and we do things, we really bring an insult to the name of God, where we do things that are detrimental to the lives of others and that are hurtful to others. Listen, we ought to pray. We ought to take our stand. We ought to have a witness. We ought to do exactly what I said that Jesus commanded us to do. We are to let this light shine. And let me tell you, God will always see that right prevails. Folks, we're in this mess because of Satan and sin. But the thing is today, we've got to realize something. We are not going to be living like we're living forever. We're going to the place as Christians that is prepared for us. And we shall see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords one day. And all this won't even be a memory. So today, enjoy the blessings of God. Live within the confines of the laws. And today, serve God. Be right. Do right. Live right. Pray right. Read your Bible. Stay in touch with God. And watch God do a great and mighty work. I pray that the words that we've shared with you this evening have been encouraging and uplifting to you. And today, let's stand for the Bible, the Word of God, and let's stand for the cause of Christ, and let's tell everybody about Jesus. That's the best message that we have to proclaim today.